I've, I've only been to a couple of these so far, but I find these are really fantastic conferences. And I love, you know, as soon as I get off stage, I'm going to be wandering around looking at the trade stands and trying to talk to some of the people in the industry here. Um, so, so thanks to Dave, thanks to Karen, thanks to Bruce, thanks to the organising committee, and thanks to all you as well. Now, how do I, how do I work this, that one there? So as, as you will have seen in the, uh, in, in, in the brief little um, sli slide there for my presentation, I'm Director of Food Regulation. I'm part of the new um, New Zealand Food Safety Branded Business Unit, which is part of the Ministry for Primary Industries. So you will have heard the Minister talking about that this morning. So within MPI, we now have four separate business units. They're still part of MPI but they're there to reflect the, the core functions of the Ministry for Primary Industries more clearly. So we have the Food Safety Business Unit, and I'm representing that today. We have one for forestry, one for fisheries, uh, and one for biosecurity. And I'd just like to point you to the, the Māori name for our organisation here as well, Haumaro Kai Aotearoa. So Haumaro is, is to shelter or to protect. So you can see, you can see what we're trying to do here. What, what we are responsible for is to provide a, uh, a safe food environment in New Zealand. And that is the basis both for the, the health and well-being of New Zealanders, but also our, um, our export markets. So why New Zealand food safety? Th this government recognised that uh, our environment is changing, our, our demographics are changing, the world is changing. So while we're still part of a much bigger organisation, this focus on, New Zealand, on food safety is, is going to be critical. So uh, our export markets are uh, requiring more and more from us, so we needed this focus on, on food safety in a dedicated unit within our Ministry for Primary Industries. There'll be a theme here. I'm going to come back to trust over and over again. So what I plan to cover today, and I've got 45 minutes, um, but I expect that I'll spend a, a limited amount of time talking, and then I'm, um, we'll be taking questions at the end. Um, and, and I hope not to talk for all that time, because I'm pretty sure I've seen someone starting to nod off in the front there already. So what I want to start with, I'll, I'll talk about the contribution of the primary sector and, and particularly the bee industry to our economy. Um, then I'll talk about what we're doing in the domestic market, particularly for regulation of, of food generally, but also of bee products. Uh, and a little bit about what that means for you. I'll then start talking about some of the more general things we're doing around our biosecurity and bee health. And also, um, and, and, and look, the irony of this is, doesn't escape me, I'm going to stand here as a bureaucrat and talk to you about how we can make things easier for you. So you might have seen the slide from our Director General yesterday, uh, Martin Dunn. In the last six years, the exports from the honey sector have tripled. So we're up to about $350 million for the last year. That's three times what it was in 2012. That's an immense growth. Uh, and for the first time, the United States uh, looks like it'll be our number one market for uh, bee products. China's currently sitting second, you can see there. So, protecting our reputation, and I am going to go on about this for some time. We are a nation heavily dependent on exports of primary product. More than three quarters of our primary products are exported. This is the driving force of our economy. Again, you might have heard our Director General talking yesterday. There was more than $42 billion worth of exports from the, from the primary product sector. And that's up from about 37 billion just a couple of years ago. 350 million of that is, is from the bee sector. And that, of course, doesn't account for um, the contribution to uh, domestic production as well. So this is something that's worth protecting. Th 
this is an area where we in government and you in the sector need to be working really closely together. And it's an area where we are working closely together, but I want us to continue doing that. Another interesting stat as well, someone's written on my notes here. Apparently 2.4% of exported, uh, we're only responsible for 2.4% of honey exports in the world. But we are the second largest by value um, in honey exports. So you would have heard the minister talking this morning about value, not volume. So we don't export a heck of a lot, but the value of what we export is really significant, and that's, that's, a, that's a great thing. We want to make sure we protect that. Again, talking about protecting our reputation. So exporting's hard. We export to over oh, around about 190 countries, and every one of those countries is suspicious of imported food. New Zealanders are suspicious of imported food. But every country we deal with, they look at these imports and they don't trust them. So it's a challenge just getting products into their borders. And it's a challenge getting in them there in a way that is fair and justified. In, in New Zealand, we're in a fortunate position. We, we're starting from a position of a lot of trust. We talk about being a trusted supplier, and we are a trusted supplier but it doesn't come easy. We're a trusted supplier because we have good science-based rules. We're a trusted supplier because we enforce those rules. Now, something I haven't, haven't put on my slide, but we're also a trusted supplier because we deal with our trading partners completely honestly. If something goes wrong in the New Zealand food supply, those overseas markets will hear about it from us first. It is really important that we don't surprise our overseas markets. If we surprise them, if we lose trust, it will just become that much harder to get your products in there the next time. Even, even though we are trusted, uh, some of you will know this already, but we have a team of about 50 people who their full-time job is just to keep markets open. So in the context of apparently supposedly fair trade and fair science-based rules, we still have a team of highly experienced people who have to work around, work around the world keeping markets open and arguing against unjustified requirements. That is an ongoing battle and sometimes it feels like we're fighting just to stay afloat. So again, going back to that point, trust is everything. Um, and again, we need to work together to make sure that we, we continue to be trusted and our exports continue to be trustworthy. So you will have heard this one, but I want to restate it again. One example of what MPI has done to ensure that our products can continue to be accepted overseas are the general requirements for export that came into force in um, February this year. So these are the general requirements for export of uh, manuka honey. Part of those general requirements is the definition of manuka. Now you'll all be, you'll all uh, remember that a few years ago there was a bit of um, a bit of a to-do in the media. That to-do was picked up and listened to, and it was heard by our overseas trading partners. And we had more than one please explain. So we're having overseas countries saying we hear that there's fraudulent product coming out of New Zealand. What does that mean? So we took that seriously. We had to take that seriously. We embarked on a three-year science program, and I'm pleased to say that's, that was good science, and that has been published in a really prestigious journal. And that's, that's important, that science base. Um, we also travelled around the country for uh, talking to hundreds of people last year about how we apply that definition to exports of manuka honey, and how we can put a framework around those exports that means that our products continue to be trusted and so your exports can continue to be um, accepted into importing countries. I will just point out that, um, make sure I got that right, not all of the, um, uh, not all of the requirements are currently in force, so uh, there is a requirement here for identification of, of uh, the boxes that only comes into force in December this year. But I will reflect back on what you might have heard Minister O'Connor saying this morning about the importance of traceability. Um, uh, we're not planning to change these requirements at the moment, 
but I think the writing is on the wall. Overseas countries, consumers, um, and even uh, New Zealanders are expecting more and more traceability. So, so just be aware of that and think what you can be doing right here and now. I know one of the questions that, that has been asked of me a number of times and probably is front of mind for you is actually how is, that, how is the implementation of that standard going? How is the implementation of the general requirements that we call a Grex and that uh, scientific definition of manoka honey? How's that implementation going? So as I've said a number of times, trust is everything, no surprises. When we, when we heard these concerns from our trading partners, we set out a plan for them, we explained what the plan was, we've kept them informed throughout, we've explained what the science is, how it works, and how it supports that definition. Um, and when it was published, we've let them know that, and we've also kept them informed of the, of the setting of the standard. And, and what I, without going into specifics, what I can report is we're seeing a fair degree of comfort from those trading partners, so we're not concerned about the implementation of that standard. It, it, it appears to be doing the trick. Um, we're not going to rest on our laurels, we're going to keep watching that, but at this point in time, we're pretty positive about that. The other question, of course, is that whenever any new standard comes in, what does it mean for the domestic industry? What does it mean for you guys who actually have to do it? So um, we've been keeping in touch with your verifiers. We know that um, you're verified on a regular basis, um, those verifiers report back to us about um, levels of compliance, etc., how things are working. And we're also running our own audit program over the top of that. Um, look, things uh, seem to be pretty good at the moment. Um, we, we, as, as issues arise, we'll keep working with the verifiers and with you guys to make sure that it's, it's uh, clear and people understand what they have to do. But certainly the feedback we're getting at the moment is fairly positive. It, we've had some pretty positive feedback, actually. Um, so at this point in time, that's, that's looking quite well, quite good. Um, but like I said, we're not going to rest on our laurels. Um, we don't have any stats at the moment. Um, I'm afraid the, the definition uh, had to also be incorporated in the custom system for harmonised um, uh, harmonised system for custom tariffs. Sorry. So we'll only start getting export data from 1st of July this year. So this is a, um, what I've been talking about is on top of the domestic standard, uh, uh, a sort of general framework. Sometimes we have to do additional things. So our default position as an exporting country is that if food is safe in New Zealand, it should be safe anywhere. If, if food is safe for New Zealand consumers, it should be safe for consumers in other countries. It doesn't magically become unsafe when it crosses the border. Uh, it doesn't always work that way from our trading partners' points of view. Sometimes overseas countries think that's not good enough, we want a little bit more, thank you very much, and they require what we call an official assurance. So they require us as the government to stand behind the product and say this stuff is safe and suitable and it's okay to enter your border. We issue about 200,000 export certificates a year and that's for about $25 billion worth of products. So whereas B products, I think you only require certification for a limited number of markets, I think there are about five markets. Uh, for meat products, um, that's ab about 100% of our meat exports require certification. For seafood, around about 90%. Dairies, approximately 80%. Sometimes those export certificates are required because importing countries don't believe the product actually comes from New Zealand. Something turns up anonymously at their border, it says it's from New Zealand, they know New Zealand's a trustworthy market, but they also know that because we're a trustworthy market, we're, we're an easy target for fraud. So they come to us and say, can you guarantee that this product actually came from you? So in that case, we will certify that product and say, yes, that is genuinely New Zealand product. And sometimes, more frustratingly, overseas countries have a different view of, of what constitutes safe product. So they require additional, additional requirements and additional red tape on top. So in some cases, we need to um, uh, a certify that that product also meets those additional requirements. Now don't, um, don't think of these export certificates as a checkbox exercise. We describe them like passports. You wouldn't dream of turning up to any country without your passport, would you, and expecting to get past border control. It just doesn't happen. For quite a lot of our animal products, it's the same thing. If, if that product doesn't have a passport, the importing country is simply not going to let it in. 
And if it does have a passport, but the importing country doesn't trust it, you can be guaranteed that it's, you're going to have delays at the border, you're going to have questioning by the border officials, and it's just going to take that much longer to get it through to your customers. So given the importance of that certification framework, we put a lot of effort into the integrity of that program. OK, I'm going to move on a little bit now. You'll be aware that um, the food legislative framework in New Zealand, there are three bits of legislation that apply to food production. Um, there's the Food Act, the Animal Products Act, and the Wine Act. So most of you will probably be operating under either the Food Act or the Animal Products Act. Depending on what kind of business you are, it's possible you're actually operating under more than one. And what we're seeing increasingly is that businesses don't, don't sit in one particular sector. So for example, if you're a winemaker and you're doing cellar door sales, you might have a cafe on site as well, so you're automatically under the Wine Act and the Food Act. If you guys are really lucky, you could be operating under all three. I'll just let people cough for a bit after that. So we revised um, uh, those requirements. There was a, a bill that was passed earlier this year, um, and that's run a bit of a ruler across those acts, and it's, it's uh, harmonised some of the requirements in them, and it's aligned some of the processes uh, uh, under those three bits of law. So specifically, we were seeking to strengthen our response to food safety incidents, uh, what we now have, we have a better ability to access information from third parties, such as verifiers. We can require information to be provided to us, because sometimes the timeliness of accessing that information is really critical. If, it, if we can get it in hours, that's great. If it takes days or weeks, sometimes we've got a real problem. Our Director General now also has uh, a better ability to issue what we call privilege statements. So typically, if there's problems with a food product, and this happens all the time, you know, these are biological systems with lots of moving parts, stuff goes wrong, we, we get that. Typically, those recalls and dealing with the food, uh, or, or the recall or withdrawal, is dealt with by the food business. Typically, that's fine. Sometimes, we might find there's a problem in market. We might find there's a listeria or a salmonella or something, and there's product out there with the consumer. And we might not be able to find who the food business is. So in that case, MPI will, will step in and we will issue warning notices. We now have a better ability to do that. So secondly, we now have a better uh, system um, framework that allows us to um, trace and recall food better. Um, we, can, we can require operators to have um, pr procedures for tracing and recalling uh, product in place, because it's always better to be prepared up front than to have to do the recall in, in a hurry and we can specify what those recall requirements are. And finally, <coughs> excuse me, finally we've got a more consistent um, approach to our compliance framework. So now we've got a, a better, a better um, uh, link between finding the problem and, and what we can, we can do about it. In the past, we had one of our only tools was prosecution, and that's really slow and is only useful after the fact. We can now issue um, what are called improvement notices. So if a, if a business is really in trouble, and their processes are out of control, we can specify that there are certain things they need to do to get their process under control within a certain time frame. We also have uh, better penalties for um, businesses that might be gaining commercially from um, not complying. And I'm sure you will see the value in that. It's not fair if you are, you're complying with the law, but you know the guy down the road is not complying with the law, so they're essentially being subsidised. So you, you guys have the compliance cost, and they're breaking the law and not having, not having to. We can deal with those people better now. That creates a better playing field, a legal playing field, and a fairer environment. <coughs> so there's some other changes that came into um, effect under the Food Act. Now, as I said before, most of you will probably be operating under either the Animal Products Act or the Food Act. So if you're operating under the Food Act, this bit's for you. If you're under the Animal Products Act, don't worry about this. So um, the old Food Act 1981 was replaced with the Food Act 2014. It has quite a different framework. And some of the changes to that uh, uh, 
Food Act came into effect in March this year, and it means that people operating under the Food Act need to be under what's called a food control plan or a national program. We're in the third year, I think, of uh, transition from the old Food Act 1981 to the new Food Act. That covers about 45,000 businesses. So it's quite a logistical exercise, um, talking to all those businesses through the councils typically, but some, often directly to make sure they understand what's required, etc. cetera, um, and, and understanding what people need to do. So the important thing for you as an audience is that uh, food, uh, the bee industry, if you're under the Food Act, you are probably under a national program, and that national program needs to be registered by 28th of February next year. So you'll know that you are covered by this if you, if you are covered by the old food hygiene regs 1974 or whatever they were, um, or if you were under a food safety program under the old Food Act, you will now need to um, meet the new requirements of the Food Act 2014. So again, if you're under the Food Act, not the Animal Products Act, and if you are covered by the food hygiene regs or, the, um, or an old food safety program, your business must be registered as a national program one, that's the lowest level of oversight, um, by 28th of February. But in order to get that registration through, you need to have your registration in by 30th of November this year. Now, I hope this isn't news to you, because we, we put a lot of effort into trying to communicate that. But if it is news to you, um, the good news is you've still got plenty of time. And we've got our people out here at the stand who can help talk you through that if you have any questions, or talk to your local council. Now, I'm just going to pause here for a little bit. Uh, you would have heard the Minister saying this morning, talking about us launching a consultation on applying the Manuka honey, the science definition, to the domestic market. So that's just been launched today. This doesn't apply to exports. We already have a definite place for exports. That's under that general, general requirements that I was talking about earlier that came into force early this year. What we're talking about now is should we take that same definition and apply it domestically? So today we've started consulting on this and we want to ask you people to participate in that and tell us what you think. So we've got three options that are in front of us. One is that we leave things as they are, we just do nothing, that's always an option. The second one is that we apply this as a voluntary definition, so we say the definition's there, but actually it's up to you whether you want to use that definition or not. The third option is this could become a mandatory standard. It could become a legal requirement that if you are selling manuka honey on the domestic market, you'd need to make, meet that same definition. So, so those are the proposals we have in front of us. So I do encourage you to um, get one of the consultation documents. They're out on our standout out there, and we have uh, a team of people who can talk to you either today or tomorrow. It's also going to be on our website if it's not already. Uh, and we've got eight weeks. So I do encourage you to participate in that, and we're planning to um, talk to a number of people around the country about this as well. But I just want to pause there for a minute and, and just let that sink in. What we're proposing at this stage is let's take that definition and apply it to the domestic market. So it is possible this could become mandatory. It's completely option at the moment, uh, open at the moment. We're not, we're not landing on a solution. We really want to hear from you what you think is appropriate. And actually, I've got some of my colleagues in the audience, so at the end of this, when, when you um, ask questions, we can, um, we can talk you through the process a little bit more. OK. Ease of business. So here I am, um, a bureaucrat from Wellington, talking to you about making stuff easier for you. Um, we are very aware that there is a lot of legislation out there. There are a lot of rules, and it's not always hard, not always easy to find. Yep, we, we know that. We have listened, and we are hearing that. 
what, what we are seeking to do is looking across our food system, the, the parts of our food system that are, are visible to you, and think, can we, can we shape that, can we design that and communicate that in a way that makes sense from your point of view? So we're particularly interested in working with small business and see and trying to look back into the system rather than from Wellington and our ivory tower looking outwards to see what, what that looks like and, and does it make sense to you. Because what we, what we hear is that it's, it's often hard to find the legislation that applies, the rules that apply. It's hard to find the right kind of information. And when we can find it, it's, it's not always that easy to understand. So what we're looking at doing, we're reviewing quite a lot of our, our notices, so there's our low-level legislation, quite a lot of our guidance documents, and also designing it in a way that just makes it more accessible. We've also developed a, um, a number of toolkits that apply under the food, the food Act that pare things down to the bare minimum. So what do you actually need to know? What do you need to do? Um, what do you need to show to, um, to make sure that you really get what, what, needs, um, what really needs to be done. There are also a number of initiatives we're working on at the moment that are probably really quite relevant for you. You'll be aware that we're developing a template for, um, under the Animal Products Act for processing honey and dried pollen and the storage of bulk honey. Um, we're also reviewing our code of practice for bee products, and that'll include more products such um, and processes like mobile extraction, uh, royal jelly, collection processing, bee venom, and also processing of um, propolis. Uh, so I, th I think we've got some documents out there already, and that's, that's work that's underway at the moment. We're also trialling something called remote verification. So one of the things we've heard, we, we know that quite a few of the businesses here and in other small businesses, you're often remote, you're regional, you're a long way away. And, and one of the big costs for you is getting your verifier, who might be potentially hours away driving out, verifying you, and then driving back again, and that's all the cost to you. So we're, we're aware of that. What we've been experimenting with is this remote verification that allows the verifier to potentially stay in their head office, um, but uh, through a, a smartphone or, or, or streaming um, video, watching, looking what's happening in your business. So, so you as an operator could be working in real time with your verifier, showing them around your business, showing them what you're doing. Um, so it's still a verification, would still have the same legal effect, but it could be much, more, uh, much less time consuming and involve less travel. So it's just an experiment at this stage, but early, early signs are that that's working quite well. So we're, we're embarking on a second phase of that, I think, uh, in next, next month. So I'm hoping that that's something that we can roll out before too long, because I could see that it will be really valuable for this sector. You might be aware of our Export Regulatory, uh, regulatory Advice Service. So last year these guys um, came to the conference and they launched a, a little booklet that was a really simple guide as to what do you need to do to export. So these guys haven't um, been resting on their laurels, they've been, they've been continuing to work away. Uh, they've provided advice, you know, specific advice to I think about 1,300, 1300 businesses, um, yeah, 1,300 exporters. And about two-thirds of those, I believe, were actually from the bee sector. So I th it's really great that you guys are jumping in and using that service. Dairy was second. Dairy were, I think, made up 11% of inquiries, but you guys are by far, in a way, the biggest users of that service. There's something else, now this is, again, this is just an experiment. We can't make any promises about this, but the same group, they're out there at the stand now, um, testing something called Thai. It's a chat box, it's a digital concierge, it's um, uh, seeking to understand the kind of questions you people will ask, understanding how you ask them, and give you a useful information in, in real time. Um, and and it, like I said, it's just a, it's just a um, prototype at this stage. But, um, but your assistance will be really helpful there. So j just by way of example, I've been talking about exporting all the way through because that's language I use. Um, what we've found is that sometimes people in the bee industry might talk about, I don't know, sending our product overseas or we're going to send it to that customer. So if you type that into a computer, it's not going to make the link. What we're doing here is trying to understand the language you use, how you describe things, and make sure that we can, we can customise our 
um, our advice and our systems in a way that, that you know, is sensible and meaningful for you. So what the guys at the moment are doing, they are testing it with a whole lot of people in the industry, so please do go to the stand and type some questions in yourself, so that'll give us a better understanding of the language you use. And we can then use that to, to customise the sort of feedback we give you. Um, it, it'll only answer some questions, but it can, it can deal with those really simple, um, quick turnaround type things and hopefully point you in the right direction. Um, so please do go out and have a chat to the guys on the stand, type some stuff in, um, see how it works for you, and we'll use that feedback and we'll use that to keep improving the service. And what I'm really hopeful for, although I can't promise anything, is that this is the kind of thing that will become a, a, permanent, a permanent offering. So I want to move on a little bit, talking about um, bee health. Um, so it's, bees are, it's important for our ecosystem, it's important for uh, the, um, our primary production more generally. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, but we have, a, we have a number of things in place, as, as do you, and this is a good, another area where we really need to be working closely together to make sure these, um, these programs continue to work. So um, it's not on my slide here, but I'll just reflect back to something um, Karen said this morning. Karen was talking about a commodity levy, and I think this morning Clifton talked about the uh, American fowl brood program. So, so, you know, no secret to you, these are really important things. But what's going to be critical, obviously, is that you guys need to find a way how do you fund these things? So um, there are a number of initiatives I know, that, know Apiculture New Zealand has underway to, to uh, shore up those programs and to get proper funding to make sure that they can, um, they can be effective. I'm not going to talk in detail about it, the American fowl brood. Clifton did that this morning. Um, just reflecting that um, we've had legislative controls for American fowl brood since 1908 possibly earlier. I think that's when the first new, proper New Zealand law actually came into force. That's when New Zealand essentially became a legal um, entity or independent of its own. So that's, what, 110 years. Um, still a fair bit of work to do. Um, not going to dwell on it. It's obviously important to you. Minister O'Connor said quite a bit about that this morning, didn't he? Um, Anything we can do to help. We are, we've got a bunch of people back home who are passionate about bee health, they're passionate about epidemiology, they're passionate about these kind of programs. And we're really keen to see the industry um, take ownership of this and, and wrap it up and start moving this program forward. And a whole bunch of people who, if we, if we know that there's a program there that's in, in place, we're, we're really keen to work with you. Um, you'll be aware of our colony loss survey as well. So this is, um, it's in its final year. Um, uh, this is the, sorry, final year. Um, it's some of the stuff you'll, you'll know already. We've got this on our website. We've got quite a nice infographic I'll show you briefly. So the average um, loss was 9.84%. That's actually quite low by international standards. Um, significant loss, um, uh, in, in a number of areas, but, but the, the lowest was top of the South Island, so, so um, yep, round here. And the guys just asked me to pass on their thanks because obviously your participation in this is critical to the success of that program. <coughs> oh, you probably can't see that, can you? So, so we've got these infographics in hard copy out again at our stand there, but a couple of things we just wanted to point out. The, the low level, particularly low level around this area here, uh, the fact that actually it doesn't really seem to have changed, although the numbers are different from 2006 to 2018, there's no statistical difference there. What is probably uh, significant, though, is the, there is a significantly larger um, rate of loss among the non-commercial sector. On to the second slide. And again, I just want to stress, these are, these are participants from the industry. So we've got 100-odd commercial beekeepers and around about 1,700 or 1,800 non-commercial beekeepers have contributed to this program. So these are, these are examples, actually, where MPI and, um, and the industry are working together. And, and this, this is a program that provides a lot of really good information um, for, um, for the, the um, health of, of, the, um, of the sector. 
Now, there's a final program we have underway. This is our B pathogen program that's, that's related to the colony loss um, uh, survey. So this investigates pr prevalence incidence of B pathogens. Um, and again, this is, this is in the final year. Um, it finishes in March next year. Um, and again, the guys back home have asked me to pass on their thanks because, again, there's a very significant contribution from the industry and a number of people probably in the audience who are contributing to this program. So this, what we're already finding out is a whole lot of really useful information about the incidence and prevalence of, of disease um, and, and pathogens um, in, in your hives and, and in colonies. Um, what this information does, it gives us a much better uh, picture of what's going on and that'll allow us to help plan a whole lot better for our biosecurity readiness, but also for you guys um, in your apiary management. I'm pleased to say that's my I think, second to last slide. You didn't nod off down there. No, that's still awake. Good eye. Um, so just, just finishing off, um, I, think, I think we're really at a, actually an exciting time. Um, this is, this is an industry that has grown so fast. It's been around forever. I, th I think what the apiary, the bee industry's been around, what, 1850s or so. It's one of our oldest industries. But just in recent years, it has really taken off. And I've heard a number of fantastic stories, success stories in this industry. But of course, we'd all like to see that, we'd like to see the whole sector continue to flourish. So we're thinking, well, what, what, what do we need to do to make sure that that happens? What do we need to do to get there? And, and I guess uh, for me, trust and unity are central. That's, that's really critical, I think, for this industry. And we need to be working, we all need to be working together. I think we're seeing some really good signs, but we need to keep, we need to keep working together. We need to keep working along that same path. So I've been thinking, what? What would I like to see from my point of view, from New Zealand food safety? I think it's really important for us to try and understand your world better, not to try and understand, to genuinely understand, to walk a mile in your shoes. What does your world look like? And then that will help us design ours, because really it should be there to serve you. Um, in a specific sense, what that means is providing you with information and advice that make things easier uh, to understand. Um, so you can provide, you can find the information you need. It's relevant to you. You know where it is, um, and and it's um, and it's timely. It's what you need to know and when you need to know it. <coughs> I guess if I'm standing here in a couple of years' time, and depending how I perform, Karen, maybe I will, maybe I won't be standing here. Um, there's some things I'd like to see from the industry as well. I think I like to see this industry investing in itself. It's a great industry, um, and I'm seeing a lot of individual examples of people you know, really trying to make stuff better, and, and I've heard about some of these today. Um, I'd like to see the industry investing in its biosecurity, in its science and research, in its food safety, and its reputational challenges. I'd like to see this sector and government working together better and that's for the ongoing success, both of you as a sector and actually for our economy as a whole. So I'd just like to say thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, do please go and speak to our people out there at the door today. Um, it's, um, it, it, really is, it really is an exciting time and I think there's really a whole lot we can do.